So, hello everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm sorry for this little technical start hiccup. I hope it's working fine right now. Um, this is our second event uh, within our event program for the exhibition Hyperscapes, which is currently open at the Kornhaus Forum in Bern. Our guest today is Melanie Kurtina. Hello, Melanie. Hi, everyone. She's one of our participants of our exhibition and I'll tell you more about her in a minute. But first, I'd like to tell you briefly what this is all about, especially about the exhibition of which this talk is part of. So, Hyperscapes, it's an exhibition which looks at how landscapes and nature is represented in virtual spaces. In ancient times, uh, in earlier days, going to the wilderness was threatening uh, but as man detached himself or herself from nature, this changed. This is visible in the 19th century landscape paintings where nature is romanticized. Showing a landscape always meant that it is looked at from a human perspective. And our look always had an influence on the landscape itself. Today in video games and in the metaverse we shape our environment precisely according to our desires and needs. So this raises the question, raises the questions for us curators of the exhibition. What does nature mean to us? Why are we attracted to real and virtual landscapes? And what are we looking for there? Do we find what we are looking for? The exhibition space at the Kornhaus Forum in Bern itself is conceived as a landscape that visitors can explore. It follows a path through seven different states of perception. Uh, after a start with historical Swiss landscape paintings by Gabriel Lory, father and son, the visitors are thrown into a first state uh, which is called escape. Uh, they start to leave civiliz civilization behind and enter nature spaces. This state is followed by immersion, going to meditation, etc. We are moving more and more away from reality. The first pieces shown include an old hunting game, Deer Hunter, from the late 1990s, a simulation of Thoreau's Walden, where you leave civilization and go living alone in the woods by Walden Pond, just as the uh, philosopher and writer Thoreau did in the 19th century. And there's also this physical and digital installation by Studer Vandenberg, showing a fictional touristic scenery from the Swiss Alps. So this is where the exhibition starts. From there, we embark on a journey to uh, digital fantasy worlds and virtual nature spaces and the uh, Berg 10 lands, which today's talk is all about, is one of these spaces. It is a work by Melanie Kurtina, who joined us here today. Melanie is a self-declared immersive artist. That's what I read on your website, which I think is really fitting. Uh, she works with references to video games and technologies from video games to create installations, games and videos. She studied at ICAL in Lausanne, where she's currently teaching video game theory. Her work has been exhibited around the world, notably at the Venice Immersive Biennale, at the Tokyo Game Show and the House of Electronic Arts in Basel. Her latest clients include, and this is uh, also quite an impressive list I got from your website, mm -hmm. uh, LVMH, Cartier, Chanel, Jean-Paul Gaultier, Dolce & Gabbana, Orveda, Tétier, Bijou, Ubisoft, Agar, Agar, <laughs> and uh, it seems to go on. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us here today, Melanie. Thank you for this uh, introduction. I'm really glad to be there with you uh, from my apartment in Paris. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you again. And my name is Christian Schnellmann. I'm co-curator of the exhibition and host of the talk today. We are holding this on Twitch um, uh, because we wanted to explore different formats for our events, from physical to pre-recorded online videos to things like this live stream here on Twitch, which is fitting since Twitch is the home of the gaming scene and well, our exhibition is about games and 10 lands looks at first sight at least also uh, like a game. Um, so 
uh, and since, since it's a game, it's something you play and that's what I just start doing now. Um, so I take over the controls and stop talking for a bit and give the word to Melanie and I have a first question for you, Melanie. Um, am I at all right in calling Ten Lands a video game? Would you agree on that? Oh, very interesting. Um, it's true that it's, this could be a, a question um, in the dating, in the gaming thing uh, that would sort of revolve and and generate a lot of passions because what is what makes a game a game? Um, as you can see here. Then lens is a virtual object that does not include a lot of uh, gameplay mechanism. You can wander around in uh, different landscapes, you can make the camera become a little more, more cinematography, go more far away, turn around and sort of wander. But that's, that's all. The, it's, it's a journey. Um, so the, the gameplay are quite minimalist. So, if a video game, what makes a video game is gameplay, is this a game? Uh, for me personally, um, I would say yes, uh, because it, even if it's minimal, it still is. Um, so yeah, I'm very, I'm happy to call this game a game. And a bit about the story behind uh, Ten Lens. I know it was created during the pandemic. And well, the pandemic was a great time for video games in general, I say, since we had to stay at home and what to do, we had lots of time at our hands. I myself started playing multiplayer games again, uh, old multiplayer games. I didn't play for quite some time to stay in touch uh, with old friends. But I think the story for Tenlands, and I'm new moving here now to the next section. Uh, the story behind Ten Lands is a bit different. How did the pandemic influence the game? Um, so myself as well, um, played a lot of games during pandemic times. I remember that uh, I got my hands on Zelda Breath of the Wild and I spent hundreds of hours uh, just wandering into the open land landscapes uh, of the game. Um, but for this game in particular, um, the, the context of it was that um, a very good friend of mine, uh, a musician called Diatoni, uh, he's based in Switzerland, and he, he told me that he was going to release with a small Swiss label his first uh, album uh, that was about to be called Ten Lands and would feature ten uh, different pieces of ambient sound, ambient music. And so, um, when he told me that and made me listen to the um, uh, to the, um, uh, the songs, uh, the, the musics that I really, really enjoyed, I decided with him that I was going to make him more than a video clip. I was going to create for him video game. And so uh, what's a bit special about this project is that uh, for once, the images uh, were created and the visuals were created, the game was created after uh, the, the, the music and not the other way around. Uh, the images go with the, the music. The music um, inspired me for this. And so uh, when the game was finished, complete, we really wanted to make like a release party or something for the album and for the game as well, to make some events, to make people know the game exists and make them play. But we were during COVID times, so this was completely not possible because of the confinements. And also, um, I, I was, um, yeah, I was in Paris and my friend was in Lausanne. So how, what could we do? Um, and I believe that releasing Ten Lands online what, on, and, and gifting it uh, to the people that bought the album was a way for us uh, to make people that were stuck at homes um, a little moment of escape. Uh, with the album and with the, the, these huge la and imaginary landscapes as well. So Ten Lands was released as part of a classic album release, which you usually would do in a concert hall or something. So this uh, kind of replaced this. Is yeah. this right? Okay, I see. Um, I, while playing, I recognized um, quite a few 
video game references in Tenlands, uh, Dark Souls for example, I think that's the obvious one, but also um, Shadow of the Colossus, uh, if you move the camera a bit back, I think this uh, relates to the, the perspective and the views you get in this game as well. Mm -hmm. But also uh, you mentioned this uh, while we were talking before, uh, there are some references from movies in there, I think uh, you mentioned Blade Runner a few days yes. back and of course I now started looking uh, for other references I couldn't see uh, any so far I guess there are a few uh, but I didn't uh, wasn't able to um, link them to their origin would you uh, like to elaborate a bit on this how did these different uh, references from video games and also from uh, movies apparently uh, get into the game what was your motivation behind this? Yes, I'm going to ask you to stay in this, uh, to, to answer your ah, question, yeah, I'm going to sure. ask you to, to stay inside this precise landscape because I could, then I could reference uh, this as well. So um, the musician Yatoni and I sort of grew up together because we lived together as roommates uh, when we were studying at Ecal. He was studying cinema and I was studying uh, new medias. Um, and so as we lived together for a bit, we shared many uh, common uh, media. We played game together, we watched movie together. And so I believe our inspirations uh, are very uh, similar as our interests are similar. And so with Denland, we wanted to, to, to pay homage to these um, very um, in, 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 the, in the less bad way possible to the very stereotypical geeky references, sort of nerdy references that we particularly love and adore. Um, as you said before, yes, the first level is very inspired by um, Blade Runner, the fog and the, the, the green colors, um, the orange, sorry, uh, colors and Dune as well, um, the movie. But this, for example, the second one, uh, is more inspired by the, the uh, by aliens and the work of uh, the artist Giger. Uh, we actually visited the, the, the Swiss Museum, uh, Giger Museum together um, and got inspired. And even in the the slight, really, really slight details, like for example, in the middle of this level, there's some kind of cave with with holes. Um, are you, I'm not sure you're able to find it. Uh, ah, what is it? Uh, yes, it, th there's some some sort of, of cave with with holes with a little dust that falls. I and might have seen it. If, yeah, perhaps if you've been under it uh, at some point. Um, but I, I remember that when we were creating it, Yatoni was was telling me as well. Oh, you could make it like uh, like Nozika. Uh, th there's a, a scene in Nozika by Miyazaki um, uh, that has this sort of cave with uh, with this dust that falls um, and even if that that's not a big reference you, c you can't even see it and no one will know this was our, our way to just uh, pay homage to what we like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the big towers you see the, the big shapes in this one as well have aliens head um, that looks a bit like you see the eyes um, looks like uh, ancient creatures yeah yeah it, oh yeah I see over there like yes. a very organic forms. So yeah. just that uh, I move to the next level. Let yep. me just pass this line. For the people watching us, um, you might have guessed it, but uh, passing this line also, uh, always means you go to the next of these 10 lands, which can be explored inside the game. Yeah. And this one uh, really heavily reminded <laughs> me of, of boss situations. I think this door opens at one point. Yeah, right. And you can see this yes. uh, kind of, whoa, whoa, that's a horrific figure there in the back. I missed mm -hmm. this at first. Uh, yeah. I mean, usually would you would assume that you now start fighting with these uh, creatures, but that's not the case for Tenlands. And Definitely. Yeah. How did the music and the game influence each other? Each other? I think you mentioned that the music existed first. Um, mm. How did you take this and transform it into these um, spaces you can explore? 
what were you, were things you looked at in the music you and yeah I think the output uh, well the the musics were completely finished when I arrived in the project um, so I had to adapt and so as I as I said um, yeah, Tony and I know each other very well and so I believe I was able to see what type of ambience he wanted to, to, to give um, while listening to the songs. Um, this one is very uh, classical gothic ruins with this like vampirish red, uh, red fog and red sky as well. Really like, uh, really like it. Um, and so what Yatoni did was that um, he drew a map uh, like like a little Lord of the Ring maps. Uh, he he drew a map with a river and with some some sort of um, of different types of uh, of landscape. So a two D map with with pens and paper, and that was some kind of guidelines. Uh, I didn't respect all of them, but that was some kind of guidelines to figure out the the journey uh, in different landscapes. So you will start in this, and then, for example, level eight. Uh, in his mind uh, was sort of a cold word you, you will hear it uh, mountains so so um, the, the 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 sounds as well sort of reminded me of uh, Lord of the Rings um, Les Mines de la Moria uh, dwarf mm -hmm. scenes um, so something a bit a bit harsh as an ambience and so that's how we 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 rolled actually and then he gave me complete freedom to do um, to respect it or not, but it was cool to have some sort of guidelines as well to treat the uh, the music into uh, landscapes. So, did he use video game references or inspira inspiration from video games as well when creating the music, or perhaps? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he already so. had kind of in mind in a in gaming terms how the how the sound should look look like as a game level. Um, I'm not sure uh, as game levels particularly, but I, I'm, I, I know he plays a lot. I know he knows a lot about games as well. Um, uh, and so I believe he was inspired as well, creating the music by games, but perhaps it's not direct references. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. When I listen to, to Ten Lands, I can sort of, I'm sure, for example, he took inspiration from um, Joey Zaishi, the, the music composer from uh, Ayao Miyazaki's uh, and Studio Ghibli's movies. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there is some Lord of the Rings as well, but um, I cannot really pinpoint uh, which games inspired him to create the musics. Um, I believe it's more inconscient, uh, n not fully conscient, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, this, these virtual words uh, have inspired him um, since a long time mm -hmm. as well. So we have talked now a bit about these landscape, about the levels you can explore. Uh, let's move a bit to the character, which is in in center, visible here. Um, we are this war, uh, playing this warrior person, and due to the full body armor, we can't really tell its gender or any other uh, properties of his identity. And video game history has kind of loaded. Uh, uh, the industry has kind of a loaded history with um, the representation of women or other, um, yeah, other people. Um, like women were often just in supporting roles or sometimes used as the a weak figure. The the male main character had to rescue. I think that's not so much so much the case anymore. This kind of um, got better. I think. And what are your personal experiences with this and why did you decide to have this uh, figure without any yet yeah, recognizable gender properties? Um, you're definitely right. Um, I know how important it is in video games to have an uh, to, to to truly make a choice about how your avatar will look like because when you play a game, uh, the uh, contrary to a movie, you're not just watching someone doing his actions, right? You're him or her or them. And so um, the, um, it has been proven that when, 
and a game decides to force you to play a character with whom you are not really comfortable with, um, gamers won't like it. Like there was a whole um, um, big movement of people that weren't happy uh, with The Last of Us 2 when uh, the trailer came out because uh, players understood they had to play Ellie. Uh, Ellie is a lesbian uh, woman uh, in a zombie world, enfin, in, a, in, a, in an action adventure world, and they weren't really, really happy to replace Joel, um, his sort of father figure that we play in the, the first game, with a woman. Um, so they're sensitive about it. Um, and myself, I agree. I'm, I, whenever I play a game, um, that is, of course, third person, not uh, f with the camera being external mm -hmm. and allows me to see my character, not when, when I have the camera inside the eye, first person. But when I have the choice to create my avatar, let's say The Sims, for example, um, people playing The Sims will spend so many minutes or and hours on creating a character they feel very comfortable with. Super important for them to choose the exact color of of hair etc and, and same for me i i, I spent so many time uh, on my elden ring character creating creating him um so I, i'm aware on how important this is um but for ten lands i simply did not i knew how important it was and that simply wasn't the the point of the game it wasn't to tell a story about someone necessarily it was less about the character than about the landscapes so um putting them putting the the the, the first the, the the character a heavy armor make it opaque uh, allows me uh, and allows the player to think that it could be anyone under it could be any any gender any age any skin color um, anyone can just project anything they want um, under the heavy armor. Uh, so I made the choice to sort of allow the player to imagine what they prefer. And I remember you did put in quite some uh, work uh, to do this as well. I think you mentioned the animations. Uh, you used animations or had a hard time finding the right animations for this figure. Could yeah. you uh, tell us a bit ab uh, more about, about that? Yeah, I can even demonstrate it. Um, so to <laughs> animate a character, I used, um, or at least I wanted to use pre-made animations. When you want, uh, when you have a full, well, this is a, a a small budget. I mean, I did this project alone. When I say small budget, it means zero francs. <laughs> um, so there was no budget to uh, be able to buy um, sort of heavy and very costful. Um, motion capture equipment in order to literally do uh, the, the movements, the animations, sort of motion capture suits, like cinema, where when you do this, you can record. So I had to, um, and of course, creating animations by hand is very complicated. And as I didn't want it something too specific, walking, sitting, uh, standing, running, ça va, uh, very classical animations, I had to uh, go online and find pre-recorded animations, right? And what the struggle was, as I said, I was, as we mentioned before, I didn't want it to give too, too many clues about uh, what stereotypical gender the, the, this character could be, right? But when I, f I was looking, for example, for running, uh, uh, for sitting, for example, sitting down um, poses, animations, I had the choice. I could either, I, got, I can demonstrate. I could either find male sitting down, which is like, like this, very, very like legs, open yeah. legs. Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah, like uh, open legs, etc. Uh, and women sitting down would be like this, you know, cross the the legs and sitting mm. like this. And so I had to find something or to modify something in order to do some kind of in between, so that he could just simply do this like this with less gender obvious pointers so it's hard if you want if you want to use assets already existing in the industry you really have a hard time finding something if you don't want to go for this classic gender stereotypes 
Yeah, but I believe more and more uh, things are are being created and and allow us to find a need between, but still a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's becoming better. Sure, <laughs> you are <laughs> gladly. Uh, can you tell us something about, we already touched this a bit, uh, about Tenland's third-person perspective? I know that you also work in VR, um, where the standard perspective is from the player's point of view, so first person. One of your latest work I've seen is a VR experience called All Unsaved Progress Will Be Lost. It looks really awesome, I hope I can try it sometimes. And I suppose this one will or is in first person, and in Ten Lands, you on the other side decided to show the character. What were your reasons for this? Mm, interesting. Um, I think I wanted. Um, I think as yeah, interesting. I wanted the. the I needed some scale um, indications. I wanted the landscapes in Tenlands to be bigger than life, uh, to be uh, really, really huge. And we're, as we were able to put the camera pretty far uh, from it, like if you could uh, put the camera far from the, the character and like show one of the, yeah, this uh, third person camera allows me to, to, to show the scales of everything else. I mean, of course, first person, you understand uh, that things are big but right now you can see this this little knight with these huge swords uh, and huge um, skeleton uh, in this kind of uh, in this place and really makes you understand how big the battle of this sort of ancient and civilizations was Just, yeah so a scale perspective i think this makes a lot of sense um yeah i i know that uh, the first 3D Zelda game, like Ocarina of Time, at uh, one point they wanted to do this in first person and I think they moved it to a uh, third person somewhere during development. I can't mm. remember the actual reasons, I suppose they were gameplay reasons. They're, it's a game where you can fight and it's uh, with a sword and it's just easier to create the game um, with sword fighting from first uh, third person so something else we discussed while putting together the program for the exhibition with uh, the other cu curators uh, Marlene and Nicholas who did this together with me uh, we looked at so-called walking simulators uh, to be included as well and Ten Lens is one of the games which could be considered uh, being one of those perhaps David Aurel is everything also so I'm wondering would you even see Tenlands to be uh, to belong to this genre? Uh, and to those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the walking simulator is a designation for games in which you mostly explore the levels by walking. Uh, at first, when the term emerged, it had kind of an ironic aftertaste. I think yeah. it got popular with uh, the arrester almost or around ten years ago. Uh, which was all about taking in the landscape and walking through a story. So first calling a video game a walking simulator meant making a kind of fun of it uh, for not um, offering the player more than just to walk, uh, to walk around. I think nowadays the term is used much more neutrally and used for artistic video games uh, with a focus on space. There are some games that I love, which could be considered walking simulators. Um, the Stanley Parable being one. And what do you think of the genre? Um, and do you think um, do you have any walking simulators to recommend? Do you think uh, Ten Lens is one of them? I think Ten Lens is definitely a walking simulator. I really like this type of games personally, and I don't feel like there's better games with bigger gameplay. Walking simulators are super legit as well. I wouldn't say that this. I mean, it's true that you can only move in the Stanley Parable, but I'm not quite sure it's um, a walking simulator in itself. I feel like walking simulator, you have less uh, gameplay elements. Um, in, in the Stanley Parable, I think the choices you're ma you make could be pushing buttons. In fact, if you pick 
one room on the left either than the, the room on the right. Um, it's like choosing. You are right. One, you are right. Touching one button or one other. So I'm not sure if if it goes in there. I mean, I wouldn't have defined it as a walking simulator, but now you're making me doubt. Same thing for David O'Reilly's project. Um, it's true that you don't have that much gameplay, but it's so complete that I am not. I'm not sure uh, it's a walk sim uh, as per se. Uh, the the walk. King Simulator I would recommend and prefer is called Proteus, and it's a it's a small indie game uh, with really really beautiful music uh, that shows a, a pixelated landscape um, in an island that is never the same, sort of regenerates um, every time you, you launch it, uh, which I find very relaxing and, and peaceful and just very beautiful. I listen to the soundtrack uh, often. Yeah, I like this uh, also a lot. I don't know, is this even older than Dear Esther? Might be. This this is also one of the like classic uh, walking right? simulators. Um, I don't know which one was mm. first. Um, I'm not sure. It's old. Uh, and now we are arriving at this uh, Graveheart kind of situation. Um, <laughs> what's this about? <laughs> um, <laughs> or would you rather keep this a secret? <laughs> no, no, no. I like telling the story. It's just um, being a... a a game developer allows you to do pretty much whatever you want with the game and I believe game developers really like to put sort of little easter eggs in their games and hide it more or less so this uh, um, sometimes players don't find it because you have to, to fetch inside the caves to, to see it and uh, it's completely unrelated to the the uh, the story of Denlands, this kind of uh, non-verbal um, story about uh, a knight and a creature uh, wandering inside uh, ruins of, a, of an old civilization, blah, blah. Um, so, sim to put it simply, when I was developing the game, um, my friend Yatoni, so the musician's cat, uh, died. She was called Calypso, and so to, she, she was a really, really, really great pet, a beautiful Siamese cat. And just to pay her an homage, I put, um, I put this here as a, yeah. <laughs> That's really as nice. An and it just stayed there. I, I think <laughs> someone at the opening of the exhibition um, assumed that this might be a pet's name. So, yeah, that's apparently the case. Yeah. And yeah. It is. Um, going back to walking simulators, which are really um, kind of simple, you, I think you could call them simple, or focused on storytelling. And was it hard to keep Tenlands so simple as it is currently? Um, because when, when working with, with students, for example, I often see that they want to put a lot of uh, features in their games. And I think it's hard. not. Uh, yeah, keeping it is simple. Did you at one point um, consider more things you wanted to add, and or was it easy for you to just uh, live it in this really meditative, simple state? I understand why your students wants to to do a lot of the things and experiment, etc. But for me, um, with this project. Uh, as I told you, it's a passion project. Uh, no one was being paid for anything. And uh, to simply put it, uh, less is more was also related to this type of choice. I don't have the freedom to spend two or three years. I mean, games with actual gameplay uh, take take years to create. I, di I didn't have the freedom to spend two or three years on, on Tenant itself. So I just kept it simple. Simply to say, I was alone. I had no team to help me develop it, so I couldn't. Uh, I I just had to to make it work with uh, with few elements. Um, I think there are more than enough people that just dream big. Even though it makes a lot of sense what you're saying now, but I think there are a lot of indie developers with really big plans, and I, I at least think it's it's hard um, being realistic as you are. But this just seems to be your strength, knowing what uh, what is feasible in the amount of time you've got there. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> just logical for me. Who's gonna pay my rent when I, <laughs> sure, when I work on sure. Tenlands? No one. 
So do I have the freedom to spend months on it? No. So just make it simple. <laughs> or if you have very, I don't know, if you have a lot of money on, on the side, if you're being financed, if you have uh, public helps, there are many, many ways to create an indie game uh, and make it big, to be honest. But in that case, that just wasn't it. So I had to make things efficient and quick. Mm -hmm. When working on this, what did you spend uh, most of the time on? I know that it's always a really lot of work putting these games together. And what was your focus while working on this? Or where did the time go? In, in the creation of the landscapes or the... Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I really enjoy this part, to be honest, creating landscapes. It's, mm -hmm. it's very funny. Um, but yeah, the I as it's minimal, there wasn't so many coding involved, but I think I spent a lot of time with lighting as well. Mm -hmm. As a, as to put it simple, I just like doing, doing that. I really like having my... It's like doing a, 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 a little map, uh, a little model when you paint little things you know the the nerdy thing um it's the same for me i just do my little landscapes uh having a camera that's up there like a god mode in which you can see everything and then i place my little trees and i paint my little grass and i place the stru structures etc and uh then what i really really enjoy doing is uh, the lightning the ambience the fog as you mm -hmm. can see um and sort of, yeah, literally taking my lights and sort of finding the perfect way the shadows would, would create also more texture. I think yeah, this was a, a big part. Yeah, I think it was really worth it. Um, yeah, I mean, the atmospheric lighting is, is just gorgeous. You can see it here. Thank you. Thank you. I like it a lot. So there's also uh, this contrast between the main character kind of armed to the teeth and no enemies whatsoever and I uh, think it's also an ironic game or kind of depressing this warrior without any mission or without any purpose at least that's my main interpretation of Tenlands did you consider this motive while working on it yes definitely definitely um... I felt like there was a lot of sadness in this character, a lot of uh, lacking of a sense. Um, I mean, he has a sword, but there's no enemy to fight. Um, and it's, I feel like he's he's super lonely in these huge, uh, huge territories. He's just finding, looking for a purpose, uh, looking for a battle, but never finds it. To me, that's uh, that's a bit depressing. I'm not sure it's ironic. It's it was more, um, yeah. A, a bit depressing, but mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like, I mean, my name is Melanie and, and it comes from the word melancholy, so finally I'm just doing or, what I was supposed to do. Or perhaps <laughs> th that's also um, tied back to the situation where this game was created during the pandemic, that a lot of us were just uh, uh, like these <laughs> lone soldiers kind of lost in space. I don't know. And searching, searching for a purpose, mm -hmm, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, you are also interested in borders in video games and I think that's also something that's a really important aspect of Tenlands since it's one of the main mechanics. You just pass this uh, outer circle, this outer border to move to a, a next level. I also think that's a really elegant solution. And um, yeah, games handle borders differently. Um, there are games who place the players on an island like Breath of the Wild. You're just on a big continent and you can't move uh, past this, this water. So that's a way to keep the, the players inside the playing area. Or sometimes in flying games, uh, you just get uh, forced back. Um, so if you leave the, the area which was designed by the developers, you um, perhaps get a notice you're um, leaving the, the playing area or something and then you get pushed back. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. here it's just a transition to the next level, which I think is really interesting. What are your uh, thoughts on borders in video games? I mean, that that's also something we can hear now. I think you um, once gave a talk on this clipping, no clipping, and we kind of can see through uh, 
the floor. I don't know if you want me to show this, but I, I also like this uh, aspect of video games, like this uh, technical glitches that sometimes happen. I think there is a beauty in this clipping thing um, that sort of fa fascinates me, but not only me. Um, yeah, the question of borders is really, really interesting because um, a lot of play. Well, when you go on YouTube, I really like when I work to go see on the internet what people think about it. So what I do often is go on YouTube, on Reddit, on on, on every WhatsApp I, I can and just type the, the things I want to do just to see how people uh, like like this, how people react to these as well. And on the subject of borders, um, there's so many YouTube videos with millions of views titled like 10 amazing out of borders experiencing things you weren't supposed to see and this sort of um, clipping uh, you see with the camera is often something players actually try to achieve by uh, doing crazy stuff such as um, bumping into every wall of the game until they find a way to see uh, or to, to, to often uh, fall uh, to, to find a glitch and be able to see outside the map and to see underneath it as if they was going to find a big secret about what's what's underneath what's behind um sort of yeah there's sort of a, a weird um a weird feeling uh, that are re that are revolving around borders the way they really want to see what's beyond what's mm -hmm. beyond the map what's behind what secrets are hiding and when you develop the game yourself, super, super cool to be able to uh, change the camera from the third person character and just make it fly wherever you want and just... You find actually new horizon and new places in your game you didn't even know they were here by changing the point of view. Yeah, I just now wanted to uh, see if I can, uh, can get a bit more of this uh, out of bounds perspective. And I ended up now in the last <laughs> level. I didn't intend to do this. So we're back in this. Uh, I think that's. Are we inside some water? Some, I think. And there's again this big figure in the background. I think that's the same as in the earlier level. We're just uh, closer here. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So. Um, this is the only other kind of living creature, I think, inside the game. You can see clues of these characters in some of the levels and mm -hmm. in the end, when you cross the light borders for the last time, you sort of join him. Um, it was this idea of creating some kind of uh, Lovecraftian uh, creature, something bigger than life, something almighty, all-powerful, that you could see uh, in the, the, the ninth uh, level, that you could see uh, beyond the fog, mm -hmm. uh, far away from the sea. And it was the idea of, of um, these characters without any, that didn't find any purpose that, was, that would then purposefully um, go into the water and just rejoin this kind of huge uh, creature. So what you can see in the end is when you're underneath the water, you can see some fishes. Yeah, sure. Uh, where you're falling under the water, and you can see that this creature has no end. Um, it's just humongous, and even too big to notice you and to actually hurt you as a boss would do. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a um, yeah despaired ending in which you just let yourself go to 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 the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow! Um, and as you can see, now we reached the very end. And also, we're soon getting to the end of our talk. Um, I have one or two um, last questions for you. So after Tenlands, where are you going? What are your interests? Are you working on something new digitally or a game or something you might tell us a bit about or what your just what's your next focus will be? So I share my time between commission work, as you said in the beginning, uh, for clients such as these fashion brands that are really quite curious about uh, what video games can uh, bring them as immersive experiences. Um, so I do that part-time, um, mainly with fashion, 
And then uh, I use some other time of my free time. Uh, I feel like it's super important, even when you have clients, to keep some time for yourself, to create the projects you want to do you. Um, and so I use this time to create projects that like tenants who end up being exhibited in, in more of museums and in galleries and the, the art side of the things. Uh, so um, right now I'm focusing on the last project I did, All Unsafe Progress Will Be Lost, which is a VR project I did alone as well, uh, that actually is being shown in different places um, around the world. As you mentioned, it did premiere in the Venice Biennale uh, this summer, and now it's going to go. Uh, it, it has went to Geneva, to Leipzig, uh, to London, to Arles, and I'm able to travel with it and meet new people and try new VR and immersive experiences. So I feel like right now I'm mostly um, learning uh, from traveling here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's time for it's time to, to, to go with it a little. I see. Did you ever consider releasing Ten Lands or any other of your creations on a more like classical um, gaming channel? I mean, some artists release their their creations on um, platforms like Itch.io or, or, or Steam even. Yeah, but I, as I see it, you aren't that interested in this. Um, oh, or am I, I wrong? Am. Yeah, you are. No, 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 I am. It's just that um, Steam and Itch are really flooded with many, uh, many very small games. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really take these platforms very seriously. That's just between me and me. And I really, really, really want to push a game on Steam. But when I do, I want to be, uh, I want this to be, I want to be very proud of it. You want to be um, ready. <laughs> I want to be ready yeah. and tenants I really appreciate it but in the end what the the players uh, that download game on Steam are maybe very used to games uh, to walking simulators that don't have a lot of gameplay and to be honest I'm pretty afraid about the the reception of it even mm -hmm. if I will I, I were um, I think I want to do something with more gameplay that would be more fitting for Steam uh, itself um, and also, um, the deal was I do a video clip in the form of a video game for you and then people get it for free when they buy your album. So we stayed like this. With my last project, All and Safe Progress Will Be Lost, I'm not allowed to put it on Steam. Um, I want to, but I can't yet, because every festival wants the premiere. Sure. It works like movies. Yep. Like they want the European premiere, the Amer American premiere, the, the country premiere, else you can show it. If I put it on Steam, no festival will want it, which I find interesting, uh, which I, I find perhaps it's it's a way to, to do this, but I understand if they want the exclusivity. I it's how it works in the movie business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, But I'm, I'm sure that uh, whenever this festival uh, side of things, uh, me moving with the project will slow down because it will, of course, um, in a few months, I think. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, no, I still have, uh, no, I'm still being contacted to show a project that I created in 2017. So perhaps it won't slow down so, so soon. But whenever I will know it's the time, I will happily release on Steam. All in safe progress will be lost for free. And then months I could ask Adoni how he, he would feel about this and just test the water a little. Mm -hmm, but yeah, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely one of my goals to release something there. I mean, you wouldn't have to release it on the, the platforms like Steam where you would really, I think, to uh, face kind of harsh feedback for, from users who aren't just used to these kind of experiences. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, there, there might be other ways to release this. Um, but uh, coming back to the VR experience, your latest there, uh, is there a place where we could view it sometime soon? Is it uh, being unfortunately, shown? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to say uh, I see. With what are the next stages. I, it's very strict. You have to wait for uh, the festivals themselves to say there's an embargo. Uh, sure. You're not allowed to tell until it is. It was in Geneva, I think, one month ago, 
was very, very cool at the Geneva International Film Festival. But uh, I'm really wishing to, to, to show it in Switzerland again, because um, even if I live in Paris, mm -hmm. I go to Switzerland all the time and I'm really eager to continue uh, my collaboration with this country. So I'm, I'm, I hopefully I'll be back soon. That would I'll be great. You. That would be great. Thank you. So um, I think we reached the end of our talk. Um, it was really nice talking to you, Melanie, and it was fascinating to learn about all that went into the making of Tenlands. And Thank you. yeah, I wish you all the best. And to those of you out there in the internet, thank you for joining us as well. Um, the exhibition Hyperscapes will still be open for a few weeks until end of January. So you can go there in Bern, in Switzerland, to play Tenlands yourself and explore um, many other digital art works and video games. I really think it's worth it. Um, so we are looking forward to welcoming you there. and. I wish you a nice evening and goodbye to you. Goodbye to Melanie. See you. See you. Thank you. <laughs>